Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello everyone, welcome back to the uh, lectures on great experiments in psychology. In the previous class, we had discussed about the new establishing psychology as a science and we were talking about the new movement of building up psychology as a science and we spoke about uh, the very famous uh, physio physiologists and medical practitioners primarily Helmholtz and Weber. Today in our class, we are going to talk about Fechner and Wundt. And of course, we will thereafter we will get to two other uh, very famous uh, psychologists, primarily Wundt's student Tischner, and also Ebbinghaus, another very independent psychologist of the time. As Fechner thought about it. Now <coughs> we know that Fechner was also a German, and he had done his medical studies at the University of Leipzig in 1817. And while he was there, he had attended. Uh, Weber's lectures on physiology. So, uh, f at this point in time, Fechner also got influenced by Weber's uh, theories on just noticeable differences. In, st in fact, along with that, he had a different uh, viewpoint towards science. So, he was he had a humanistic approach towards science, and he fe felt that science should be approached from the point of view of consciousness instead of. Um, materializing it and uh, he uh, bringing it to uh, mentalistic le uh, to materialistic levels of uh, elements. Now, um, this uh, he rebelled against the uh, current existing uh, scientific uh, training and uh, he brought it out under his under the pen name of Dr. Mises. He wrote several satirical essays ridiculing medicine and science. He uh, did not like the atomistic approach of science and uh, as I mentioned earlier, he was more towards a viewpoint of uh, seeing science as a uh, study of consciousness. Now, uh, as you can well understand, even in the previous class, we had talked about uh, the German movement of science as compared to the British and the American uh, movements. Now, uh, the British and France, we, s we spoke about Europe uh, of how uh, they were taking uh, science considered to be uh, only a part of physics and uh, chemistry, movements in physics and chemistry or primarily the physical sciences. But in Germany, the biological sciences and other uh, aspects of social science were gaining ground. And in this uh, state of affairs, Fechner's view was also um, influenced. And Weber's theories, Weber's lectures had a major influence on him and he uh, tried to establish a mind and body relationship. And he was the first one who started saying that a quantitative relationship could be identified between mind and body. And on October 22nd, 1850, Fechner had a flash of insight. He felt that the connection between mind and body could be found in a quantitative relationship between a mental sensation and a material stimulus. So, you could actually show that quantitatively, that this is the first time anybody had mentioned it, that you could actually identify um, mind and body relationship and explain it through quantitative terms. So, Fechner believed that an increase in the intensity of a stimulus does not necessarily produce a one to one increase in the intensity of a sensation. So, if I, um, if I uh, pick up a 1 gram of uh, weight does not mean that I, my perception of this will also be that of 1 gram. And if I add 1 more gram over here, it does not mean that here I will not take it as, e as unequal. So, he said that this is not so, if, if this was considered as a unified whole, then perhaps 
you know uh, it would depend on the sensation that this stimulus is creating for uh, to me to for me to understand that this is different. Now, I as uh, I am telling you several times that this is uh, if this is a unified whole. So, if you consider this as one weight together and this as another weight, I might only uh, this though as you can understand that this is heavier, because there are two elements here and this should be lighter objectively my sensation may not consider this as uh, lighter to this. Now, this as per uh, Fechner is a quantitative relationship, where uh, it does not directly the stimulus directly does not produce a sensation of a and it is not on a one to one increase. Rather, he said that for the stimulus has to be increased in a geometrical progression for the sensation to change on an arithmetical progression. So, what he meant is you have to if, if this is double then perhaps I will understand the difference. Now, if there are 4 over here. So, if I have 4 weights over here then I will understand the difference perhaps when there are 2. So, if there is so the difference will be only observable if suppose this had 4 and this had 3 then it would perhaps not be understood the difference between the two weights would not be understood. So, if this had 4 columns and this had 3 then perhaps this would not be understood. <coughs> Okay. So, uh, now uh, the next thing. So, here if I give you another example as you can see on the slide uh, the example it could be that adding the sound of one bell to that of an already ringing bell produces a greater increase in the sensation rather than adding one bell to uh, 10 others already ringing. So, if you have if there is the sound of one bell already ringing and you introduce the sound of another bell then uh, maybe the, the it will add on to the increase in sensation. But if there are 10 bells already ringing and you introduce the sound of another bell. So, you make it 11 bell then it might not be noticeable. One example from the of this is that if you are uh, traveling in a in a very uh, busy road. So, and there is too much of sound of traffic. So, an additional sound of traffic unless it is extremely shriek or uh, you know of extremely high amplitude you will not be able to understand another addition of a sound of uh, in the of a vehicle sound um, in, uh, in a lot of traffic if there is a lot of traffic around. On the other hand if there was only one car who was honking and uh, there is a new car that starts honking. So, the if there is an addition of another sound to only one stimulus then you will be able to distinguish and you will be able to say that okay, the sensation there is another sound. So, you can actually there is an increase in sensation, but if it is th there are too many vehicles honking and uh, there is one more uh, sound of a horn added to it you might not make the difference at all. Just like in the previous example where I showed that addition of another weight may not actually make you uh, understand the difference between the two. Now, this means that the amount of sensation or the mental quality depends on the amount of stimulation that is the physical quality. So, to measure the change in sensation we must thus measure the change in stimulation. So, how much of sensation is produced will also depend on how much stimulation is being made. Now, it does he said that it is possible to formulate a quantitative or a numerical relationship between the mental and the material worlds. So, to understand how much of a stimulus is required to produce a sensation and then how much of an additional stimulus is required to produce a change in stimulation. 
So, you can easily find out through an experiment and Fechner way back in the 1800s did actually experiment on this. Strangely, uh, you know Fechner uh, was had been involved in several forms of experimentation and uh, one of his experimentation with light rays, um, he was looking at the light rays um, uh, with a screen and that had almost damaged his uh, eyes. So, he had impaired his vision to a great extent um, while doing his experimentation. This is a little off record. Okay, so, now to understand a change in sensation, you can actually carry on this experiment at home and you can see um, how um, heavy a particular weight feels. So, I have just put some sugar uh, on a teacup a small teacup and I think it will be around maybe 10, 15 grams of sugar. Okay. So, you can try this out at home and uh, it is uh, quite similar to the experimentation that Fechner tried out. Mm. So, this is a very rudimentary form. So, to measure how heavy a particular weight feels, first measure by how much the weight must be decreased in intensity before one is barely able to discriminate the difference. Say, I can do this with a single weight, I can do this with two weights also. So, apparently this is equal right now hmm. and now I pick this up and I say this is equal to this. So, now how much do I need to change to understand this is lighter or heavier. So, say I reduce a little bit of the sugar, I reduce a little bit of the sugar and now I see well is this lighter? No, it seems the same. Now, this is a standard weight. Now, I reduce a little more and here I can see the difference. So, yes this definitely is lighter. So, this is definitely lighter than this. Now, so this process can be again then I can actually remove a little more to see when is the next difference that I find. I can actually count do this with one weight also. So, say I am picking this up and how much do I need to remove say a little bit I have removed and here is this lighter than the previous one or is it the same and then you reduce a little more and is this lighter than the previous one or is it the same. So, this can be repeated till the, so every time a change is noticed you can wait, uh, you can see the weight of the um, of this uh, and see what is the difference in weight that is required to understand that there is a change in sensation. And you will see that every time you notice the difference in change, it is generally constant. So, uh, the difference is constant and this difference is the differential threshold. Now, this process can be repeated until the object is barely felt. So, you can actually start removing this till at a point when you are, now you cannot do it with this, you will probably have to do it with another thing where you cannot feel a weight at all. Like if I put this on my hand, I can hardly feel the weight. Now, <coughs> if every decrease in weight is subjectively equal to every other decrease, then the number of times the weight must be decreased or the just noticeable, just noticeable difference can be taken as an objective measure of the subjective magnitude of the sensation. So, what does this mean? That this change in weight is actually the change, it brings out the change in sensation. So, that is the objective measure of the sensation and in this way we are actually the me measuring the stimulus values <coughs> to necessary to create a difference in two sensations. So, you are when you are measuring the weight, you are actually seeing what amount of weight 
what amount of stimulus change in real terms in objective terms is required to bring about a change in the sensation. Now, uh, what is Fechner's contribution to psychology? Mind it, Fechner was a physiologist and he had no intentions, the, the psychology was third of his choice. Uh, so, he had no intentions of actually uh, using, uh, bringing up psychology as a new science, but his uh, contribution to psychology is immense. The immediate result of Fechner's insight was his research on psychophysics and we have discussed about the mind body relationship. So, what is psychophysics? It is a relationship between the mental and the material worlds. So, Fechner is the first one of course, Weber is important, but Fechner crossed the barrier between the body and mind by, rela by relating one to the other empirically and making it possible to conduct experiments on the mind. So, when you are talking of the, the uh, development of psychology as a science, we know that uh, philosophers would con consider it as the psychology of the soul, psychology as a study of the soul or the science of the soul and then it came to uh, study of the mind. And now, from mind we are actually uh, trying to establish a scientific interpretation of the system. So, we are trying to establish uh, here uh, that uh, it can be mind can be measured. Now, the empiricists of the time, the empirical philosophers of the time had started questioning uh, it on the basis of experimentation. Any question, any philosophical question query they tried to establish through ex experimentation. And here Fechner is one of the major contributors to psychology where he tried to establish that experiments could be conducted on the mind. So, he showed that by now it was established that the mind existed. So, how do you know that the mind existed? that you could actually experiment on it and you could experiment on it through the and find out that sensations are not a direct product of the stimulus that is presented. So, or rather uh, it is not a one to one relationship between a sensation and a uh, stimulus and a sensation. So, if you uh, give uh, a one unit of a sen uh, stimulus, it may not uh, produce a one unit of a sensation. And uh, the uh, after that, if you increase the stimulus by another one unit, it does not mean that there will be a change in sensation uh, by another one unit. So, it could be that you have to increase the sense stimulus to say uh, 4 units to have a sensation of one unit. So, there is the concept of the threshold. So, the point where you can differentiate that the sensation is present and from there on by increasing the sensation. So, here we come across the influence of physics in uh, the development of psychology also. So, um, like say we know that there is an absolute threshold. So, there is a um, say if we talk of audition. So, 20 to 20,000 hertz would be the audibility range of an of a human being. So, anything below 20 hertz would not be uh, audible to the individual. So, it does not mean that the stimulus does not exist. So, but if the for a human being to understand the auditory sensation to work, it will need to the stimulus uh, range has to be beyond 20 hertz. Similarly, if the uh, stimulus range is beyond uh, 20,000 hertz, then the individual will not be able to understand that sensation. So, it is too uh, much for our too much of vibration for our tympanic membrane to take. So, that is our ear membrane and we cannot understand the sensation uh, rather we cannot perceive the sensation. So, here uh, you see the influence of physics also taking uh, you know uh, showing that uh, you know stimulus and sensation uh, could be related and you could Fechner showed that it could be quantified also. Now, uh, that brings us to the next very important person in um, psychology, the new era of psychology uh, that is uh, and the another German uh, scientist and medical uh, practitioner and here physiologist primarily and here uh, he is also known as the founding father of psychology. So, 
th how uh, this is where uh, you know this was a platform created for psychology to be built up and we saw that Helmholtz, then Weber and Fechner all three sci German scientists were um, approaching the human organism and the, its psych the psychological processes through different ways. And they had uh, brought about the um, platform, they had created the platform to develop the new science of psychology, but yet there needed to be one individual who would um, bring and accept or make uh, the world accept psychology as an independent discipline, scientific discipline. And that is where Wilhelm Wundt came in. So, uh, by this time, by the time of the 19 middle of the 19th century, we see that people were starting to investigate mental phenomena and techniques were developed, apparatus devised and a lot of interest was aroused in understanding mental phenomena. There were British empirical philosophers and astronomers who em emphasized on the importance of the senses and there were German scientists now who were actually seeing how these senses functioned. So, we have physiologists actively working on understanding sensations and the sense organs and uh, there were others Britishers who were actually trying to establish that these uh, were important to understand the sense organs. Now, uh, the positive intellectual spirit or the zeitgeist that is the intellectual movement of the time encouraged the convergence of these two lines of thought and this was the platform where there was somebody who was needed to bring up or introduce the new science of psychology as a separate discipline and that is where Wilhelm Wundt came in. So, we will discuss about Wilhelm Wundt in the next class. Thank you.